We got a great episode for you today on the Blake Benz Podcast. Uh, the Blake Benz Podcast is part of my business, Good Advice, also known as Good Advice Coaching. We are a business coaching company, and hopefully we are giving good advice to people. Today is ideally no different. Uh, I appreciate those of you who have been following me for a while and been supporting me and always love the messages, emails, whatever I get from people that say, hey, enjoyed the episode, enjoyed what you're talking about. Uh, and even appreciate some of you who say, hey, I disagree, and I here's what I think about this, and here's what my experience has been. Uh, I am absolutely a fan of civil dialogue, and I believe that, hey, the only way we're all going to grow in this life is if we're willing to have our opinions disagreed with and talk to and just to exchange ideas. That's how we make it happen. So, I want to talk about today's episode. I am very excited. We're going to be talking about innovation today. And it's a word that I'm, I'm, I, whenever I talk about this topic, I have people who, for whatever reason, get not necessarily resistant, but it becomes a challenge to really visualize what I mean by it. And it's the same conversation I have whenever I talk about company culture or organizational culture or Heck, I don't even really ever use the phrase organizational culture because uh, it, it's become too academic a term. It's not it's not practical enough term. But sometimes when I talk about culture, I have people who they they just it, it's such an intangible. It's like, OK, Blake, where are you going with this? I get the same reaction whenever I talk about innovation. Now, part of this has come through. The, the reason I'm talking about this is because. The, the there are some things that are happening in the digital space and the what what we call the digital market space marketplace. So th- this is like basically online is the simplest way to understand this. There's things that are happening online. There's also some really great conversations I've been having with people on innovation in general. One of those is with uh, Josh Ayers, who's going to be on the podcast in a few weeks. Had about a two-hour conversation with him yesterday, and I'm if if I had not had another meeting to run to, I would have probably talked to this guy for another two or three hours. And this guy is just an innovation genius. Uh, so I think you're going to enjoy that episode as it comes down the pike uh, here in just a few weeks. So let's talk about innovation. Let's start with what we mean by this, and then let's also talk about why it's important for you in your business, okay? So when we talk about innovation, the simplest way I can describe it, we're basically talking about how can you how can you change the way the game is played? And a good way to think of this would be something like, uh, you know, maybe a certain industry, market, whatever has always operated uh, for the last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years a certain way. And it's understanding, okay, we there, there's an opportunity here if we change the way the game is played currently. So probably the best example, and it's and I use this example so often, but it's just such a relatable example, Blockbuster and versus Netflix. Blockbuster had this model of if you ever wanted to rent a film or if you wanted to go out and get something, you had to physically go to the store. You could only rent, you know, one or two, or I don't know what the limit was. And basically, you know, you had to have it back in a certain number of days and they would charge based on the number of days that you had it. So one of their promos was um, like rent it for five days for $5 or five ninety nine or something. And so Netflix then comes along and notices that, you know, we have this, this opportunity where, streaming is becoming more popular and and heck I think at the time I didn't even know how popular streaming was. I don't know a lot of people who were streaming in general and yet they said okay can we take this technology this this concept of streaming and can we make it a a an offer that we do for people who are wanting to get away from the model of going to the movie rental places and what's really wild about this conversation is you probably, if you're old enough, you probably remember blockbusters going out of business, you know, and just disappearing. And you may also remember other rental stores going out of business. I remember there was one uh, near my house 
and I was looking to rent a movie, and I, I drove down there. This probably would have been maybe like uh, maybe five or six years ago, and their the doors were closed, and they had a sign up that said "Going out of business." And I thought, wow, I mean, I guess I guess this model just doesn't make sense anymore, right? And so the reason Netflix has so much of the market share today and has so many users today is that it was able to innovate. Another really uh, great example of this would be like Uber. In fact, Uber is probably the epitome that people love to use, especially over the last two or three years. In fact, it's so widely talked about that people, they're trying to take the Uber model and apply it to so many other things in life. So how do we how do we Uberize this industry, right? And so when you think about Uber, the genius behind Uber is, you know, you had like the taxi or the cab service and you had a company that had like the capacity, excuse me, the overhead of, you know, all the taxi cabs and, uh, you know, all the people that are on their, their um, on their, uh, you know, they're paying out salaries to who are part of their staff. Uh, and what basically happens is you have a company that comes along and says, we're going to become a multi-million dollar company that doesn't have a single full-time employee. I mean, it has like its its internal, like central team, obviously, but our workers are going to be 1099s. So they're going to be they're going to be contract employees, and we're not going to own a single vehicle with our company. I think the statistic I saw was that Uber has a uh, higher stock value than Ford. And it doesn't even have any cars of its own. So when we when we talk innovation, what we're talking about is, okay, this is how it's always been. Now, how do we do something differently? Now, a lot of people, when they think innovation, they think tech. They think some kind of startup. They're thinking, you know, what's the next Google? What's the next, you know, whatever app you have on your phone? You know, sometimes they even think about Apple and like how did Apple innovate the cell phone industry? And these are all really, really great examples. But but I, I think if you restrict innovation only to tech, you will miss what it means to really innovate. Because to be a leader in your market share, to be uh, a, a, a leader in terms of, you know, you're leading the way and growing revenue wise, you have to be innovative. And, and here's what I mean by this. You have to be aggressively seeking out new ways to get to solutions cheaper, faster, more convenient, uh, with better outcomes for, your, for your, uh, your users or your customers or what have you. And, and obviously, you've, you've probably figured this out by now, you know, you really can't, you don't have this, the space or time to innovate when your company is falling apart. And it kind of, it speaks to why, you know, getting your house in order, so to speak, and getting your company operating at like just a basic functioning level, it's so important, not just in terms of the short term, but also in terms of the long term, because... How can you ever take the time to think of new ideas, new strategies, and what have you if if day to day, you know, you're barely holding this thing together? You know, day to day, you're just barely trying to sell enough to be able to, uh, you know, not go under. And I'm even wondering for my own business, you know, what does it look like to, to innovate the coaching industry, right? I mean, if you if if it's typically been this model where you know, you hire a coach and they work with you one-on-one. I mean, how do you integrate technology into that? And how do you innovate? I mean, what, what does that look like long-term, right? So we're going to talk about a few examples that are happening locally to me and and what you can do about it. Uh, I'm also going to put this in my newsletter that's going to be going out tomorrow. Definitely email me, Blake at Good Advice Coaching, if you want to get on that newsletter because I'll put some of the content in there as well. And it'll give you something that you can forward on to somebody else. So I want to talk about a few different companies. You've heard me talk about Ronald McDonald at length. So I'm not going to talk too deeply about them. But Ronald McDonald, I really appreciate Stephanie Medford, the CEO. Uh, She's going to be on the podcast, I think, next week, maybe the week after. And something I've always admired about her is her uh, reward structure for her employees. So she runs this this million dollar plus nonprofit. That's right, it's a nonprofit organization. She brings in over a million dollars in funding. Her people who actually run the funding branch of her nonprofits are part time employees, 
and the way that she has innovated compared to other nonprofits, which I've worked with a lot of nonprofits, is she has taken an extremely data-driven approach to how her company operates. In fact, it's so data-driven that it, it probably has more, it probably uses more of an analytics approach than some, than actually many for-profit companies. In fact, I was talking to a business owner just a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's a print shop owner. He's doing around $700,000 in revenue. And he said the data that they have is literally just the number of sales they have. They don't know what product's selling. They don't know the price points that are selling. They don't even know like any kind of demographic data on the customers who are buying. You know, I couldn't tell you like the age range of the customers who are buying. He was like, dude, I'm just winging it. I just know that I've sold about $700,000 worth of product this year. And that's all I got. You know, I don't have any other data. Whereas if you check out Ronald McDonald House, they have data on who comes into the office, who's staying with them, how long they stayed, what they needed. I mean, it's it's countless, it's it's far beyond even what you maybe would naturally think about in terms of what, what that data might look like. So they've innovated in terms of their approach to operating their nonprofit. They've also innovated on their compensation model. You have other nonprofits that, you know, they give somebody, maybe a volunteer or a part-time staff person, or maybe even a full-time staff person, they give them like a pat on the back and you're doing a great job and you're, you're living out the mission here. Well, when's the last time you heard about a nonprofit that was giving out several thousand dollar bonuses to its employees? When's the last time you heard about a nonprofit that had a better incentive model than, again, many for-profit companies? See, you have a nonprofit that is, and I'm going to use this word a couple of times, it's disrupting the nonprofit industry. And the reason I talk about Ronald McDonald so much is because there are so many nonprofits in the area, and Ronald McDonald is is like heads and shoulders ahead of many of the other ones that I've worked with. Now, I've worked with plenty of really phenomenal, great, awesome nonprofits, but I've also worked with a lot that weren't super great. They weren't super functional. And the gap was really wide between them and how Ronald McDonald was operating, right? And so Ronald McDonald is a really great example of that. The nonprofit world doesn't innovate proactively. And that's because there's often this issue of funding. It's it's often there's a business model that just doesn't make sense. You know, we don't have a business model that actually gives us the space. Because here's, here's what innovation basically means. It means you're willing to take on the risk to try a new idea. And it's not even like risk in terms of time, like we're going to commit our time and energy to this thing. It's resources. A lot of times it's funding. You know, it's, 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 uh, I was talking with the guy uh, a couple days ago who he was sharing how he was talking about final mile, excuse me, final mile food delivery services, you know, like DoorDash or Grubhub or Waiter. And he was talking about how Google and eBay and, and Amazon are all pilot testing their own version of this and spending thousands and thousands of dollars doing it. You know, it, it's, it's tremendous risk to actually try innovation out. And a lot of times it doesn't work out, right? And so if your business isn't functional from a foundational standpoint, you'll never be on the cutting edge. You'll never be forward thinking because you are always reacting to what's happened in the past, you're always reacting to what went wrong the day before. It's really hard to be focused on what's what's coming down the pike and how the, the, the marketplace is changing when you're always looking over your shoulder as to what went wrong before. And the, the problem with this in like the nonprofit world is you see nonprofits that have really phenomenal purposes and missions and, you know, their impact is so needed, but because they haven't innovated it, it has now killed their impact. And I can think of one nonprofit locally that essentially the way they operated in terms of a funding base was all of the employees, the, the majority of their funding base was employees who were part of this nonprofit would be asked to donate to the nonprofit. So if you're going to work here, we'd like it if you also donated here too. Well, the problem with that is that maybe that worked 10 or 15 years ago it doesn't work today. And the reason I know it doesn't work today is because that nonprofit had a uh, several hundred thousand dollar, maybe even a million dollar plus shortfall 
uh, I don't think it was a million dollars. I think it was, I think it was a few hundred thousand dollars shortfall where they, I mean, they were totally indebted. They, they missed their goal by this massive amount because, wow, our employees aren't donating the way they were 10 years ago. And that's a nonprofit that wasn't aggressive enough in recognizing, okay, what are some new ways that we can attract donors? What are some new ways that we can, that our business model can operate? Again, it worked 10 years ago. It just doesn't work today. Blockbuster worked 10 years ago. It doesn't work today, right? It's the whole concept of what got you here won't get you there, won't get you into the future, right? So we have to be aggressively thinking about, Okay, what does the future look like? And the problem with this nonprofit was not only did it it hamper their influence, but also they were a nonprofit that donated and gave out grants to other nonprofits. And some of those nonprofits, it was like having you know the legs cut out from under them because suddenly they were you know where they had were really relied on a significant grant from this nonprofit. Suddenly now they didn't have it. So what do you do, right? And it's this whole concept of how do you survive long term if you're not innovating, right? Now, it's not just nonprofits we see this as as a problem in. There are plenty of for-profit companies. I mean, I started the conversation by mentioning a few of them. I want to brag on uh, one company, Waco Title. It's a title company here in Northwest Arkansas. They're growing up to 24 locations. They are they, they, now, first of all, it's, it's no surprise why they're growing. They have an incredible foundation of culture, leadership who's incredibly humble. They have people who they really value their employees, and they're sincerely wanting to invest in those employees. So naturally, you probably heard the expression, healthy things grow right? I mean, healthy things will go on and they'll grow. And so you have Waco title that is either, either they just opened their, or they're about to open their 24th location. And they've run into this issue of, okay, we are growing tremendously, but the way that, you know, our funnel of applicants, the people who typically come to us, there's not enough people out there that matches the need of what we have. So, so being reactionary, a company could say, well, I guess we're going to have to slow our growth or or actually, a, a lot of companies they 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 grow and they allow the quality of their company to just totally tank. You know, they 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 just allow their company to. We have this unchecked growth that's happening, and we can't. We don't have a wide enough funnel of really qualified people, and so we're bringing in low quality people that is hurting our brand long term. But hey, we got to grow, right? Well, Waco Title being proactive and being innovative said, you know what, we're going to create our own training program and we're going to bring on applicants and you know what, there's not a golden handcuff involved, there's not any kind of requirement that forces them to work for us, but we're going to train them in the title industry and also we're going to show them how phenomenal our culture is and so we're going to develop and build our own personal program that gets the applicants we need to grow and scale our business. This is the epitome of what innovation looks like. And I was talking to the director uh, who who is overseeing this program, and the word she used was, "We're just, we're just, we're disrupting the title industry. We're changing the way the title industry, the game is played." And I so appreciate that because because so many companies aren't thinking outside of the box. They're not thinking about how can I grow and develop my company. Now, you'll notice something, and I mentioned this before. Innovation brings on so much risk. You know, it requires so much risk. And I mentioned already, you have a a title company. There's no golden handcuff. They're not requiring these people to work for them. I could go get my free training and I can go work at another title company. You know, I don't owe anything to you. So they could absolutely be doing something incredibly risky by by developing the time, energy, money. I mean, she was telling me how they've brought on these other companies that are assisting them. And so you're you're actually spending money out of your company's bottom line to develop this program. It's incredibly risky, right? Now, I don't mean risky in terms of like they're doing it, uh, you know, laissez-faire or like just flippantly, just, yeah, sure, we'll put together this program. I mean, they've actually thought this through quite a bit. But innovation takes risk. You know, it requires risk. It requires the opportunity to fail. And it, I kind of think about, I think about sort of the Thomas Edison uh, phrasing of like, you know, the guy. I guess he failed like 499 times, and the fifth, the 500th time is what actually worked. 
that's kind of what innovation looks like. You know, I mean, you, you, you have all these, these attempts and ideas and ways you try to change the game and a lot of them don't work, but probably the worst thing you could do would be to say, okay, yeah, we're, we're going to, that first one failed. We're never going to do it again. And that's actually what a lot of larger companies do. They, they give a team the leeway or the traction or the, the runway to actually create something and do something. But when it doesn't pan out, the boss says, well, see, that's why we don't do that here. You know, that's why we don't in, invest money in that way around here. The other thing that's, I think, really tough about innovation is that innovation, I, I was I was talking with someone uh, sometime last year, about a year ago, and she was interview she was interviewing me on my perspective on innovation. And she was asking, you know, what are the things that have to happen to successfully innovate? And one of the things I said was, I said, well, you got to get lucky. And she said, lucky? That's, that's not a good answer. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And she was like, you can't say you have to be lucky. You know, lucky implies that, I mean, it's luck, right? I mean, it's, it's, there's no skill involved. I mean, I mean, what kind of, that's not a very sexy answer that I, to innovate, I have to be lucky. And I was like, you know what? Obviously there's all these other things in play, but the bottom line is a lot of times you got to just get lucky. You know, we look at YouTube and we say, wow, man, YouTube really innovated the video. I don't know what you call it. The video industry Man, you know, the people who created YouTube, those are some innovative, disruptive people. You know, there were there were plenty of other YouTube type services before YouTube come along came along. Why did those not work compared to YouTube? Right? I mean, you look at Google, there were plenty of other search function uh, you know, companies. Amazon, there were plenty of other, you know, door delivery services plenty of other options. Sometimes you have to be lucky and have the incredible timing. And and even in in the case of YouTube, that's really what it was. It was timing. You had these other companies that came along and yet the technology really wasn't there. You know, the the way that uh, your browser, like, and I'm going to make it sound really old, you know, whenever you were using like AOL or (laughs) whatever browser you used back in the day, it, it, you know, it, it didn't have the functionality behind it where you could take a video and just pop it up and play it. So you had these companies that were trying to develop this and it just it just wasn't working, wasn't panning out. And then YouTube replicates what someone else has already been doing and now the technology is really there. The timing is perfect. And so I, I think, you know, being someone who is okay with or who's eager to innovate, sometimes it takes understanding that, Sometimes timing is is all it is. And it's timing and understanding that, you know what, the success of this idea, maybe it's out of my hands. You know, and that's not a discouragement not to innovate, but it is an encouragement where if you innovate and fail, you know what? Maybe you didn't fail because you're incompetent. You know, maybe you failed because it was just bad timing. Right? And I and I say that because I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, people who run startups, and they're really discouraged in them in themselves. They're You know, they've let imposter syndrome uh, set in and they're thinking, I could not make this happen or I couldn't get my business where I wanted it to because of my own problems. And it's like, you know what? It might be that you just inherited a a dysfunctional model and it could be that you tried to innovate where the environment just was not, it wasn't fertile soil for whatever, whatever seeds you were trying to plant and whatever new idea you were trying to create. What I do know, though, is that I think in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see, you know, if you look at your Fortune 500 list, I think you're going to see a very different picture in the next decade. And the reason it's going to be a very different picture is because these bigger companies are slow. They operate out of very complicated processes. So they're slow, which means they can't adapt to how the marketplace is changing. And it's changing so fast. And sometimes people ask, you know, how can I keep my my finger on the pulse for where the industry is going? And I, I think, you know, I'm going to obnoxiously, I know I, I always rag on social media, but I'm going to tell you to get plugged in on social media. If you are not on social media every day, 
If you aren't connected to people in your industry and what they're doing, you're going to miss it. Your business is going to miss it. And really, frankly, there's no excuse not to. We live in an age where people are so connected. I mean, I can literally, if I wanted to, I could, ha- I could, I could talk. I, I have a channel through Twitter to talk directly to the president of the United States. Now, we're not having a conversation, obviously. But it's amazing. You think about it 10 years ago or even 20 years ago. What would you do? I guess you would write a letter, you know, and maybe it would go to some. Now I can go straight to his inbox or his wall or whatever where where he can see that, right? So you have an access to people in today's day and age that you've never had before. So whatever your industry is, whatever your job is, how will you connect with people in your industry so you can see what are the strategies that people are trying? What are the things that people are doing? You know, what are the new, the, the new latest things that people are doing for their businesses that you can take and apply to your own business, right? And it's not even, you know, and if, if anything, it kind of takes the pressure off you where it's like, I don't have to be like this genius Albert Einstein type person. I just have to be connected. And I don't mean connected like there has to be these really awesome people that know me. I just need to be online every day connecting with people so I know where the industry is going. I know that sounds exhausting. I know that sounds time consuming, but it's also the price you have to pay for the sake of your brand. Now, some people, you know, in terms of the direction of their business, they're not looking to grow this this massive corporation. They're pretty content with their revenue. They're, They're, you know, when they think about even their nonprofit, it's like, you know what, we reach about I don't know, maybe maybe a thousand people per year, and that's that's where we're pretty content with. You know, we don't really we're not really looking to get that to five thousand or ten thousand, or you know, we're we're okay with that. You know, buffering or changing or squeezing or growing, you know, every year, uh, and and that's that's okay. But if you want something that exists ten years down the road, you're gonna have to be in the know. You're gonna have to be aggressive. And something else I'll, I'll share on this too. And it's a knock on, uh, it's a knock, I talked about this last week in my newsletter. I'm going to probably put something on LinkedIn and it's probably going to really piss off some people because I, I say things that, you know, in my mind are very forward thinking and this is the way that we're going. And you have people who've been in the business for a lot longer than me who really see what I'm saying as kind of like heresy. It's like, how dare you say that? And like one thing I put in my newsletter last week and I'm going to share it on LinkedIn in the near future is strategic plans are really a waste of time. Now, they're not really a waste of time. I'm not saying if you if your company has one, you should throw, you should throw it out the window, but but maybe you should throw it out the window. You know, it's 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 less about do I have a strategic plan? And it's more about am I thinking urgently and strategically about the next six to twelve months or eighteen months? And the reason I have found myself knocking strategic plans is I've been seeing companies who they have like the, the 20, 30, 40 page strategic plan and it's over like the next three to five years. And again, maybe that worked 10 years ago, but think about this. Five years ago, five years ago, Uber was just getting started. Five years ago. That was only five years ago. You know, there's such a synonymous brand with travel now that you would almost think they've been around for a decade or more. That's how fast industries can change. And it's, it's coming quick for your own industry. And so to be aggressive and urgent, and you know what, we're going to put it, we're going to put together a strategic plan and it's going to be, it's going to be all on one page and it's going to be an aggressive plan for the next six months, 12 months, whatever. You know, that's what it, that, that's the exact reason why a lot of these companies, these large companies will not be able to make it into the future because they're so addicted to a grandiose process that is clunky and that frankly, it makes them slow. It's, it's not going to pan out long term. So having said that, you know, I don't know if I've given you any direction on what to do for your own business other than just scream at you and tell you, you have to innovate. You got to be forward thinking. But I, what I hope I've done today is I hope I've made it just slightly more tangible than maybe it's been before. And if you don't know where to go from here, if you don't know where, where to take this conversation, my advice would be to take the people closest to you who are either in your company or they know your industry well and ask them, what does this industry look like five years down the road? 
You know, what does it look like long term? When we envision it, when we imagine it, what does it look like? What what does that feel like? How would our processes change? And I think just getting the conversation going is sometimes the best you can do. You know, I, I have a my brother in law works for a company called Crema. And they're a software company. And every other Friday, they close their offices down and it's all internal innovation. What are some ideas we have? Where can we be going? Where can we be moving? Now, again, you need a functional business model to actually do that. But they're understanding that we have to create the time and space for these conversations to happen so we can actually move forward. Make that happen in your own company. And I guarantee you, you will create a brand that will endure whatever changes are coming down the road. As always, you can email me, Blake at goodadvicecoaching.com. Thanks so much for listening. Check out my website, uh, get on my newsletter, follow me on LinkedIn. You know, I'm just gonna pepper all the, the ways you can stalk me if you'd like, and I hope to hear from you. Thanks so much for your support. We'll have a new episode out next week, and I will talk to you then. See ya.